Hey. All right, welcome, <laughs> welcome, 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 welcome to Starbase. Uh, so it's been uh, almost two years since our last update, and a lot has happened since then. By the way, I'm getting like a strange audio feedback. I don't know. If, do I sound okay to you guys? Okay, great. <laughs> so it's been two years. Uh, since we had our first uh, Mark I rocket, um, and uh, a lot has happened since then. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the progress, uh, but I'm just uh, uh, incredibly proud of the SpaceX team and um, all the support that we received from Cameron County, uh, from Brownsville, from uh, South Padre. Uh, and if, I, I know some of you in the audience, uh, so th thank you very much for your support. So. So uh, before we jump into the details of what, uh, what's happened over the past two years, I think it's worth just uh, talking a bit about this. Like, um, like why, <laughs> why are we doing this? <laughs> you know, this, I mean, it's pretty epic, but, but, but what's, the, what's the, sort of, the sort of deep meaning behind this? Like why build a giant reusable rocket uh, why make life multiplanetary? Um, and I, I think this is just an incredibly important thing for the future of life itself. Um, so, and, and there's, 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 there's both a, I, I call it the, the sort of the, 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 the defensive reason or the life insurance reason. That, that's, that's one part of it, which is that there's always some chance that something could go wrong on Earth. Uh, the dinosaurs are not around anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, we could, there could be some calamity that we, where we do ourselves in, or there's just a, there's a natural disaster. Now, I'm, I'm naturally an optimist, so I, I think the, the probability of that is low, but it is not zero. And, um, and eventually, the sun will expand, um, it might take a few hundred million years, uh, so don't hold your breath. But eventually, uh, the sun will expand and destroy all life. So for those who really care about not just the humans, but all the life on Earth, it is very important, essential, that over the long term, that we become a multi-planet species and ultimately even go beyond the solar system and bring life with us. And you know, we, we are life stewards, life's guardians. They, you know the. The, the creatures that we love cannot, they can't build spaceships, but we can, and we can bring them with us. <laughs> and I think that's pretty important, you know, for, for those that, that care about the environment and, and, and care about all the creatures on Earth. Um, so that's like the, 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 I would say, like the defensive or the life insurance reason for life collectively. But there's also um, an inspiring reason, which is that life can't just be about solving problems. There have to be things that inspire you, that, that move your heart, that make you glad to be, when you wake up in the morning, you're excited about the future. Um, and going out there and being a multi-planet species and being a space faring civilization and making science fiction, not fiction forever, I think that's one of those things. You know, I think we, 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 that's just, it, that's what fires me up the most is like, let's go out there and find out what this universe is all about. You know, are there other species out there? Uh, maybe. Um, you know, hopefully that, that it's, I mean, we, we, I, I, I mean, we want to go find out what the heck's going on. <laughs> what is going on? I mean, we're, you know, um, how do we get here? What's the meaning of life? 42, but, what, yeah, but what's the question? Um, and um, you know, if we go out there and we explore the, the galaxy, ultimately, then we can find out some of these questions. And it would just be very exciting to do that. Um, and something we can all look forward to. Um, and, and even you know, whether somebody chooses to go or not, um, I think you know, vicariously we can all go there. Just like with Apollo, where um, you know, only a handful of people went to the moon. But in a sense, we all went there. 
humanity went there. And um, so even if somebody doesn't choose to go themselves, I think vicariously through, through others, they, they, they will go, they will understand, they will experience the universe. And um, I think that's incredibly fundamental to an exciting future. And that's, that's why we're doing this. So. And um, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the rebuttals we'll sometimes hear is like, sure, but what about all the problems on Earth? And uh, I completely agree that the vast majority of resources should be dedicated to solving problems on Earth. Absolutely. Um, I'd say like more than 99% of our resources should be uh, oriented towards solving problems on Earth. It's imp but it's, so it's important to note that like NASA's uh, annual budget it is only 0.36% uh, of the federal budget. And in fact, of, of the national GDP, it's less than a tenth of a percentage point. So it's like we're, we're, we're <laughs> We, you know, we're only spending 0.1% <laughs> of our resources on space. I think, I think we, that's okay. You know, like we, we'll be fine, you know. Um, so just to, you know, just to make sure people don't think like, well, we, is he suggesting that we just spend everything on space? No, I'm suggesting like maybe half a percent or something like that. Uh, we, we'll probably be okay. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, given the, this, Establishing security for life itself, and, and having an exciting future, and inspiring, the, you know, kids um, about the, about the future. I think it's 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 worth it, basically. <laughs> yeah. So, well, how do we do this? How do we uh, make life multiplanetary? How do we, what, what's the first step? And. Um, the essential technology, the, the holy grail breakthrough that's needed is a, a rapid and completely reusable rocket system. So this has never been accomplished before. Um, and a lot of people for the longest time thought this was not possible. Now with Falcon 9, uh, we've been able to show that uh, you, can have um, you can have reuse of a boost stage and reuse of the fairing. So with Falcon 9, we've de demonstrated a lot of reuse of the, the, the boost stage and of the fairing. Um, we we've have uh, over 100 uh, re uh, reflights of the, the fairing over, it's, it's, I mean, of, the, of the booster, and I'm not sure of the fairing number, but it's a lot. Um, and uh, and that, that's, a, that's a big step in the right direction. With Starship, we're aiming for full and rapid reusability. So, uh, You know, we obviously need to accomplish that. That's not uh, <laughs> done yet, but, um, but but the success is one of the possible outcomes, uh, which I always think is uh, when embarking on a, an endeavor, success should be at least one of the possible outcomes. Um, and this for this design, I, that that is the case. Um, so the and we're aiming for uh, rapid reusability, uh, which is why the the booster is, is going to take off and then fly back to the launch tower and uh, aspirationally uh, get uh, land on the arms, um, which uh, does sound insane, um, or uh, as uh, Bill Riley would say, audacious. Um, and um, but I, I, you know, if if um, if it does come in too fast um, and um, and shear off the arms, then I guess it will be a farewell to arms. <laughs> Sorry. There's the dad jokes, uh, you know, I have to warn you, they're only going to get worse. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, here I'd really just like to congratulate the, the SpaceX team um, and, and also uh, thank NASA, the FAA, the uh, Space Force. Um, and, and everyone, and, and all of our customers that have, have helped us uh, get to this point. Uh, it's insanely hard to uh, get a rocket to orbit. Um, insanely difficult. I have huge respect for anyone who's, who's gotten a, a rocket to orbit. It's, it's, it's so hard. And we've had 144 successful launches, 106 landings. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I actually, these days I have to look on the internet to say, how many langs have we had? Uh, the, I'll have to ask the internet. <laughs> um, so, uh, 83 uh, flight, flight proven uh, 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 launches. Um, and um, although, although I have to say, I still have like, like <laughs> launch PTSD every time the rocket takes off. I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> I, I, I just see all the ways that it could fail, <laughs> like, um, but, um, you know, and, and then this, this year we're, we're actually uh, aiming to have um, around 50 launches, so it's about a, a launch per week on average, and, um, yeah, so it's a uh, hell of a year we got ahead of us, um, and <clears throat> it, it, I, in terms of um, mass to orbit, if you look at, like, tonnage to orbit, uh, the, the, this this uh, bar chart that uh, we'll show here uh, really illustrates how profound a, r a rapidly reusable rocket, uh, especially a big one, uh, is. Uh, what what effect that has on total uh, tonnage to orbit? Um, so the the total mass to orbit to date of Earth is a, is around fifteen thousand tons, maybe fifteen sixteen thousand tons, um, and. Um, the mass uh, per starship um, after a year, just one year of launching, as if it launches three times a day, uh, would be equal to all the mass of, to orbit of Earth uh, to date. That's, that's just one starship uh, launching three times a day for, for a year. Now, if you have, you know, uh, <laughs> Ten starships ish, <laughs> then, uh, and we'll have more than that. Our, our goal is to be making at least uh, a, a one stack per month, uh, and then ultimately, um, potentially a ship every three days. Uh, the, there'll be more ships than there are boosters because the the booster actually, even though it's gigantic, uh, will come back in about six minutes. Um, excitement guaranteed. <laughs> so. It only takes about two minutes on ascent and then about four minutes to return. So uh, you'll know soon. Um, the, the, the ship uh, has to complete at least one orbit around Earth and sometimes uh, maybe three orbits or, or more. Uh, and each orbit is 90 minutes. So the ship uh, is probably you know, er reusable about every uh, six, six to eight hours. That's, uh, that's why we say sort of three times a day for the ship. But in theory, the the booster is capable of being uh, reused every hour. Um, so the, the, the propellant pumps are designed to fill the rocket in uh, about half an hour. So the, this really is designed for rapid reusability. Um, so it, it, with, if you can do r roughly a, a million tons to Earth orbit, th that's comfortably over 100,000 tons to the surface of Mars maybe 150,000 tons, depending on how good the landing system is. So <clears throat> now you can only go to Mars every two years. Uh, so uh, and, and I think maybe roughly you need about a million tons on Mars to have a, a self-sustaining city. Um, but the, the critical threshold, I think, for Mars is to uh, have a city that is self-sustaining. Um, it's going to be incredibly difficult to make a self-sustaining city because if it's missing any ingredient, any ingredient at all, um, however minor that ingredient is, then if the ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, uh, the city will die out. So the, 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 the critical threshold to pass uh, one of the most important great filters for any species is to have have the, the, the other planet no longer dependent on, on the original planet. So I don't know exactly what that tonnage is, but I suspect it is at least, um, if one tries to get the right order of magnitude, about a million tons. Um, hopefully it's not more than that. Um, Starship is capable of doing that. It's capable of, of, of getting, getting a million tons to the surface of Mars 
and creating a self-sustaining city. Um, and I think we should try to do that as soon as we can. Um, the window of opportunity may be open for a long time, and I hope it is, but it, it may also be open for a short time. And this is the first, this is the first point in the four and a half billion year history of Earth that it has been possible. I mean, let that sink in. I mean, if there's a sink, let it in. Um, <clears throat> Still knocking at the door. I mean, it's a sentient sink. Let's face it. Let it I mean, it's, come in. Um, so, four and a half billion years. It's been a while. This is the first time it's been possible. We need to seize the opportunity and do it as quickly as possible. I mean, to be frank, civilization is feeling a little fragile these days. Um, and like I said, I'm an optimist, but I think we've got to protect the downside here and, and, and try to build that city on Mars as soon as possible and secure the future of life. Um, and it's going to be an incredibly exciting adventure. Um, now, the, 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 uh, the, the sales pitch for, for, for going to Mars is that um, it's going to be a cramped, dangerous, difficult, uh, very hard work. Uh, you might die. Um, and um, that's the sales pitch. And I hope you like it. <laughs> so for, far from being <laughs> some sort of escape hatch, <laughs> it will be extremely difficult and dangerous and, and tough. Um, Mars, Mars is a fixer-upper of a planet. And um, so it's, it's going to take some work to make it, make it easy to live there. But one day we could make Mars a planet like Earth, and I think we should. So uh, just some facts about Starship. And th these, these numbers will evolve over time. Um, so uh, the height of the ship is about 50 meters, 164 feet. Uh, the 9 meter or 30-foot uh, diameter. Well, you can just see it, basically. Um, <laughs> um, it's got about 1,200 tons of, of propellant on the, the ship, and uh, thrust is about 1,500 tons. Um, now, these numbers will, you know, will probably add more propellant over time, increase thrust. Um, diameter will, will stay the same. It's a huge, huge pain to change diameter. <laughs> so that, that'll tend to stay the same, but it'll probably get a little bit longer. And uh, we're expecting payload capacity of uh, 100 to 150 tons, depending on, on which orbit. Um, so to, uh, to a Starlink orbit, uh, it, roughly 100 tons. Um, yeah. Over time, I think we can probably get the, the orbit for um, orbital refilling, the, the, the payload to an orbit for orbital refilling to about 200 tons, uh, which is going to be very important for uh, getting to Mars. So for getting to Mars, you, you, you also need the orbital refilling. Just like you have um, aerial refueling, um, ro the rockets will need orbital uh, refilling. It's actually mostly uh, oxygen. The, there's um, three and a half tons of oxygen for every one ton of fuel. So that's why it's refilling, not refueling. So. Uh, heat shield. <laughs> so this is the world's largest heat shield. Um, and uh, this is, uh, we actually make this at, uh, at a little factory in, in Florida near Cape Canaveral. Uh, we call it the bakery. And uh, we're actually using a lot of techniques that are uh, used for roofing tiles. So we, we need to have a heat shield that uh, is capable of resisting extreme heat, but also is not uh, crazy expensive. And um, our heat shield team has done, done amazing work in creating uh, the world's largest uh, heat shield and one that is uh, reusable. Uh, but also uh, robust and uh, low cost. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a crazy money heat shield. And um, yeah, we need, need good heat shield technology for uh, entering from orbit. Orbital, orbital refilling. Um, <clears throat> we were going to do an animation of this, but it uh, looked a bit wrong. Um, <laughs> it is a fluid transfer. I don't like Um, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> play a little Barry White, you know. Uh, okay. 
Um, so th that's one of the technologies that is necessary for um, getting to Mars. So uh, the ship would get to orbit with, with its payload. <laughs> and, um, and, and then uh, then in orbit, we'd r refill the tanks so it would have enough propellant uh, to, to get to Mars. Mars is far. Um, so now, now with, uh, this is essentially uh, docking in orbit. And, and I, w with um, Dragon docking with the space station, this is a technology that, we've, um, that SpaceX has become quite good at. We've done, um, I, I think at this point, a couple dozen uh, dockings with the space station. And it's, it's actually way harder to dock with the space station than to dock with yourself. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it, it is a thing we need to, to, to uh, solve for Starship, but I'm confident that we can do this because we've done uh, a lot of uh, orbital docking already uh, with the Dragon. Um, but this is going to be an important thing to, to demonstrate. Um, what won't be necessary in the near term for Starlink launches, but it will be necessary for, for Mars and the Moon. So let's see, super, the Super Heavy Booster. So it, it was 70 meters, um, but then uh, there was an extra half barrel section that the team deleted, and totally accidentally, it's 69 meters. <laughs> It's also booster four and ship 20. I mean, this is a pure coincidence. I, those numbers won't leave me alone. I, it's just, um, I hope it's good luck. Um, so yeah, so, <laughs> so propellant capacity is like around 3,400 tons. I think it, this, like I so said, these, these, it'll probably, uh, it, it will increase over time, probably get to 36, maybe 3,800 tons. Um, Thrust is around 7,600 tons. Uh, that'll probably increase too over time. Um, just to put this into perspective, though, the Saturn V was uh, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and um, Starship is 17. So it's more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V, which was quite. That was that's the largest rocket ever to get to orbit. Um, it's worth noting, Super Heavy is is the the largest flying object of any kind, or will be. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, um, yeah, very, very big. You can see it right there. Um, the, 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 that booster has 29 engines. Um, the, the next booster, uh, we actually increased the engine count to 33. We've kind of bounced around on engine count. Um, but because um, I think at one point we had like 37 engines, and uh, <laughs> they went to 29. Uh, we've finally settled on, on th 33 engines, which, which is about actually the most number of engines you can actually fit under that, that booster without like expanding the diameter. Um, yeah. And then this, this tower. Uh, this, this tower from, from design to construction was uh, 13 months. So it's quite an, quite an epic structure. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's really worth emphasizing that the the whole launch system, which is basically stage zero, uh, is, um, I'd say, as complex and difficult as either the booster or the ship. So I, I really want to emphasize that this is uh, and it's, it's a very difficult thing that requires a lot of hardcore engineering. And uh, it's really, um, like I said, the, the, the tower and the launch system which I call stage zero, is just as important as stage one and stage two. I mean, this is really some, some wild stuff here. In fact, I mean, hard to believe it's real, except, you know, <laughs> it's right there. So, yeah. And then Raptor development. Uh, Raptor one was 185 tons of thrust. Uh, Raptor 2 is 230 tons of thrust, and I think over time uh, we can get that to probably 250 tons. Um, so that's, uh, and it's also um, significantly simplified. So you can see the difference between uh, V1 and V2. Uh, this, the, the V2 is, there's, you know, V1 looks like kind of like a Christmas tree <laughs> spaghetti pile. Um, a, lot of, a lot of fiddly bits. Um, and V2 is uh, greatly simplified, 
while also increasing thrust at the same time. So it's, it actually, um, Raptor 2 costs about half as much as Raptor 1, despite having much more thrust. Uh, and I think just generally being um, a, a much easier engine to build uh, and a more robust engine. So um, very excited about Raptor version 2, and it's, it's only going to get better from here. Yeah, so Raptor 2 is pr pretty sick, um, and uh, we, we've actually, the, the peak thrust that we've operated Raptor 2 at it at this point is uh, 247 tons, um, and so I'm, I'm confident that uh, with some improvements we can, we can get to a 250-ton uh, operating point and, um, and, and continue to simplify and uh, sort of robustify the engine. So it's, it's really, a, it's a spectacular uh, piece of engineering, extremely difficult <laughs> to make and, and succeed. Uh, this is, the engine has been mind-bogglingly difficult, uh, but it is uh, one of the essential keys to, uh, I mean, it is, it is essential, obviously, to, to making uh, Starship work. Um, it, it'll be the first uh, full-flow stage combustion engine to, to get to orbit. Um, yeah kind of need that, need that uh, ISP and thrust to wait. So, um, so why, why Starbase? Um, a lot of people like, like to say, like, why Starbase? Um, why, why here? And um, we, we kind of needed a, a, a confluence of factors. Uh, the getting to orbit, you want to launch eastward so that you have um, help from Earth's rotation. So the closer you are to the equator, the more of a sort of a boost from Earth rotation that you get. So you want to be as south as possible uh, and launch eastward. Um, and then, you know, it's always possible that uh, something goes wrong. Uh, and, and so you want to have a, 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 a good clear area. You want um, several miles uh, around the launch site to be uh, unpopulated or at least clearable. And that doesn't actually leave a lot of options. Um, it's basically here and, uh, and Cape Canaveral, or Cape Kennedy, is, is where uh, are the two possibilities. And then because we have had a, a lot of launches going out of the Cape, um, we didn't want to disrupt the Cape uh, activity, the operational launches, um, with um, sort of the advanced R&D of, of uh, Starship. So it was important to decouple the operational launches from the um, from the R and D launches, and and that's why that's why we're at this uh, location. Um, and once again, I just like to thank uh, you know Cameron County and uh, the Brownsville South Padre Padre and, and uh, the <laughs> the uh, re remaining residents of, of Boca Chica Village, um, <laughs> um, where, where I live, by the way. It's my primary residence. Is that little village over there? <laughs> so. Um, and it's, it's been great. It's been great uh, being here and, uh, yeah, like super appreciate the support of the community. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you. Yeah. So I think we've got a, a video to show what we hope will happen uh, with launch. Play it now. <laughs> oh wait, uh, sorry. <laughs> we have some upcoming uh, uh, Starship missions. Uh, orbital flight is really just the beginning, uh, so we, we're, we're going to have um, a number of Starlink uh, missions uh, that will launch uh, Starlink satellite version two. Uh, but uh, even more exciting than that is the the NASA uh, human spaceflight mission. Um, we're incredibly honored to that, that, that NASA has selected uh, Starship to uh, take astronauts back to the moon for the first time in, in half a century, which is kind of mind blowing. So, um, 
I'd just like to say, like, we're, we're, SpaceX is just d deeply honored and appreciative that, that NASA would, would uh, uh, choose us for, for this uh, incredibly important mission. And um, we'll get it done. Um, and then th there's also uh, the Dear Moon mission, which is uh, um, uh, going to take um, artists around the moon. And um, that's uh, Isaku Miyazawa. And he, he's uh, going to select, uh, I think, a dozen artists and, um, and, and do a loop around the moon, which will be very exciting. And there's going to be some uh, future announcements that I think people will be pretty fired up about. So um, anyway, super exciting future ahead with uh, this. Uh, there'll probably be a few bumps in the road, you know, but uh, we want to iron those out with uh, satellite missions and test missions and, and, uh, and get to a high flight rate and, and then ha have something that's extremely reliable uh, for, for human spaceflight. So, um, yeah.
Let's make this real. Any questions? <laughs> Let's make this real. Yeah. Cool. Far away. <laughs> Anyone? I, I can't see you, so you probably just have to yell it out or something. Yes, there's, there's six Raptors on Starship. Uh, currently, three uh, with the vacuum nozzle, three sea level. Sorry? Check, check. Um, and uh, I think, uh, pro if I would say, like, we'll probably end up adding another three uh, vacuum engines to kind of, you know, fill in the gaps um, and stretch the ship, uh, I think is going to make a lot of sense. You'll have to yell, unfortunately. So I keep... we, we, are, we are building a, uh, a launch site, uh, a Starship uh, launch, launch tower at uh, 39A at uh, Cape Kennedy. And um, we are also building a Starship production facility at, at the Cape. So we'll have a production facility and launch site here and a production facility and launch site at the Cape as well. It's important to have redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's Irene Klotz with Aviation Week over here. Um, I've got lights in my eyes, so unfortunately I can't see. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm blinded. <laughs> So I'll, uh, well, I can hear We're where the speaker is coming from. Okay. But, uh, um, you should, I believe you're, you're expecting to hear in a couple weeks about the uh, possible finding of no significant impact from the FAA. Have you gotten any indications if that's going to come through? And what is your time frame for uh, the orbital flight test? Thanks. Um, well, we don't have uh, I, we don't have a ton of insight into the where things stand with the FAA. Um, we have gotten sort of a, a rough indication that there, there may be an approval uh, in March, but that, that's all we know. So, uh, hi, Elon. Uh, Marcus Harvey. Uh, can you talk about uh, the point-to-point -point capability? Where, is there a possibility between here and uh, Cape Canaveral? Oh, <laughs> well, we, yeah, I guess uh, technically, yes. Um, so, I mean, depending on how, on how good things get with, with Starship, um, there are some scenarios where uh, it, it might actually be the lowest cost means of transporting cargo long distances. Um, so the interesting thing is that the capital efficiency of, of a rocket is, is, is much better than the capital efficiency of a plane for long distance flights. So if you, now this would really be more for, uh, you know, if you're going like, I don't know, a quarter or a third or halfway around the world, um, where, you know, if, if, if you went from, I don't know, say here to Singapore or something, like that's a long flight. So, I mean, I don't know how long that is. I'm not sure you can even go there nonstop, but it's probably like 20 hours plus. And, uh, but in, in, a, in a rocket, it would be uh, less than an hour. So like 45 minutes or thereabouts. So um, that means you, you, you'd be able to use the rocket 20 times more often than, than an aircraft. So it's 20 times the capital efficiency. So provided the propellant cost is uh, you know, competitive with, with aircraft. Um, and bear in mind, like I was saying, like, uh, it's, there's three and a half tons of, of, of liquid oxygen for every one ton of fuel. Um, so, uh, and, and liquid oxygen is basically just uh, elect the cost of electricity, um, and um, you know because it's in the air basically. Uh, so, I, I, there there is a scenario where it's economically compelling to do long distance uh, cargo and and people transport uh, with Starship. Um, That'd be very cool, and I think that that'd be great for getting a lot of a high flight rate and uh, you know a, a business case for supporting a lot of starships uh, operating. And basically, nothing's faster than you know an ICBM. <laughs> we got a question right here, Elon, right in the middle, right here, right hands up, hands up in the. I mean, it's I, I literally have lights in my eyes, and I it's pitch dark in front of me. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Hi, Elon. Uh, Michael Sheets with CNBC. 
you opened this presentation by addressing a little bit of the criticism that's been aimed at space travel being seen as maybe a pet project or not really valuable to folks who have problems here on Earth. I was wondering if you get in a little more into the specifics on comparing not just the U.S. government spending that's happening on space travel versus other things, but maybe in terms of SpaceX itself, how you and private investment on a dollar value compares to the taxpayer-funded projects or contracts that SpaceX has won over the years. Well, I, I think uh, you know the ob objectively, the um, the cost efficiency of SpaceX is um, I, the, the 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 best in history. I think for for any rocket development, uh, and um, and we are talking about a you know uh, a rocket that's uh, tw more than twice the mass and thrust of a Saturn V, and also designed to be fully reusable, which is obviously also much better for from an environmental standpoint, to have a fully reusable rocket um, uh, for a development cost that is, uh, I don't know, between 5 and 10% of Saturn V. So that's pretty good. Because um, we need to make it work. So it's not work yet, but it's, uh, it will work. Um, might be a few bumps along the road, but it'll work. Um, I feel, uh, at this point, highly confident that we'll get to orbit this year. Um, that's you know it, we're, we're making a lot of rockets, making a lot of engines. We're we're close to achieving um, one ra a Raptor two uh, every day production rate, so we're sort of seven a week, um, which is is tough for a complex engine. Um, and uh, I think by the end of this year, we'll be able to produce a ship and a booster per month. Uh, so. This is this is, I don't know, at least an order of magnitude, maybe maybe two orders of magnitude, uh, more efficient than anything in the past. Um, yeah. So. Hey, Elon. This is Joey uh, Roulette for Supercluster. Um, just wondering, what does SpaceX's plan and timeline look like if the FAA ultimately decides? to do a deeper environmental review of uh, Starbase. And then one other thing, I, you might be able to give us an updated figure on what it costs to uh, Starship and what it would customer, cost a customer to, uh, to buy a flight on one. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am optimistic that we will get approval. Um, for, um, like, I think there, objectively, I think this is not uh, something that will be um, Harmful to the environment. We've obviously uh, flown uh, the ship several times um, and done, you know, multiple landings and t you know takeoffs and landings. And we've, we've fired the engines a lot. So um, I think um, the, the the reality is that the, that it would not have a significant impact. Um, uh, now, of course, the, the, that doesn't mean things don't get uh, delayed from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and we are in a lit litigious society, and so there's, there's always sort of lawsuits from someone, lawsuit city. Um, so um, now we do have the alternative of the Cape, um, and um, we, we actually applied for environmental approval for launch from the Cape uh, a few years ago and received it. So uh, we actually are approved from an environmental standpoint to launch from 39A. Uh, so I guess our worst case scenario is that uh, we would, uh, I don't know, be, be delayed for, for six, six or six to eight months uh, to build up uh, the, the Cape launch tower and launch from there. Um, from a cost standpoint, um, the, the, the costs will uh, improve significantly over time. So uh, because it'll take us a moment to achieve uh, full reusability and full and rapid reusability. Um, we'll probably lose a few vehicles along the way. Um, you know, with uh, Falcon 9, I think it took us 14 or 15 attempts to successfully land the first booster. Um, I don't think it'll take us that many with uh, Starship because we have that experience. Uh, but it's, uh, it's certainly not a sure thing that it'll work the first time. Um, I mean, from a cost standpoint, I mean, it's a 100-ton capability to orbit. 
uh, on a marginal cost to launch basis. Uh, w w you know, that doesn't count fixed costs, which obviously have to be covered. It, it, it may be as little as a few million dollars per flight, um, maybe even as low as a million dollars per flight. So this is crazy. These are crazy low numbers uh, by space standards, Cra crazy low. Um, now, we, we do have to cover fixed costs, so um, depending on what our launch rate is, we have to divide the fixed cost by the number of launches. So the more launches that, that happen, the lower the total uh, cost of f fully considered cost per flight would be. Um, but I'm highly confident it would be less than $10 million uh, all in over, th you know, if you say like fast forward like two or three years from now. I, I think it's highly likely to be everything included, less, less than $10 million a flight for a 100 ton to orbit capability. And 100 tons to a useful orbit, not to a low orbit. To, to a low orbit, it would be 150 tons. So this, this is r ridiculously good by, compared to everything else. And, and it should be, because you, know, if you, th you think of like, if, if this was a, if, 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 if aircraft were not reusable, how much would an air ticket cost? I mean, you know, it's like, you know, for, I don't know what, uh, you know, a 787 or 777 goes for these days, I don't know, a few hundred million dollars. The, if, you, if you had to spend, you know, $200 million every flight, it would be very expensive to fly somewhere. And you'd need two of them for, you know, another one for the return trip. So, uh, you know, it would obviously be absurd. Um, so if you can imagine if we were in a world where aircraft were expendable and then, someone came along with a reusable aircraft, it would be an absolutely profound game changer. That's what, that's what needs to happen for life to become multiplanetary, and that's, that's what this, this design, I'm confident, is, is capable of that. It's just a question of how long it will take to um, refine that and have it really dialed. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, this is Andrea Leinfelder of the Houston Chronicle. Um, I wanted to know, when and how do you plan to test star, um, Starship refueling in space? And also, aside from NASA, Dear Moon, and Starlink, can you elaborate on the potential customer base for Starship? Thank you. I, I apologize. I actually was, I zoned out for a second. I was just thinking about something. Could you say that question again? Sorry. Uh, um, when and <laughs> we have some mic issues. But. Okay. When and how do you plan to test Starship refueling in oh, space? Yeah. And aside from NASA, Dear Moon, and Starlink, can you elaborate on potential customers for Starship? Thank you. I, th I think um, orbital refilling, and I, I want to emphasize it is refilling, not refueling, because it's uh, three and a half times as much oxygen than fuel. Um, so we mostly are carrying oxygen up there. Uh, I, 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 optimistically, towards the end of next year, um, I think uh, I'd be surprised if it's longer than two years for uh, doing the refilling. Um, and there, there are a lot of, of, of additional customers that will want to use Starship. I don't want to steal their thunder. That's, they're they're going to make their announcements. and. Um, so, but I, I think this will get a lot of use, a lot of attention. Um, it, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it, you know, once we make this work, um, it's, it's a, an utterly profound breakthrough in access to orbit. Um, and when you have an utterly profound breakthrough, it's, the use cases will be uh, hard to imagine. I mean. Uh, you know, when, when, when aircraft uh, first came along, they were, aircraft were viewed as toys, like they were like a, a novelty, um, not a means of transport. They were like, oh, look, we can fly like a bird briefly for, briefly and dangerously for a few minutes. <laughs> um, you know, n n nobody at the time, or at least I think very few people at the time, thought that there would be a global aircraft industry with airports throughout the world carrying people uh, to every part of, of, of Earth in 
ridiculously short periods of time. Um, you know, when the, when, when the Wright brothers first took off, I mean, most people were just riding horses. So you're like, oh, you know, it's like riding a horse, see this crazy device, looks like witchcraft. Um, and uh, they would not have imagined that there would be uh, aircraft flying, you know, t tens of thousands of aircraft flying to every corner of the world. Um, so I, I think we made this, this really could be an extremely profound situation. Um, the, and, and we really can't even imagine all the use cases at this point. So. Hi, Elon. This is Steve Clark with the Brownsville Herald. Thank you for the presentation. So if the FAA does come back and say we need an uh, EIS, does Starbase bounce back from that at some point? I, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, would, it would obviously set us back uh, for quite some time because uh, an EIS takes a lot longer than uh, an EA. Um, uh, so we would, we would have to shift our priorities to uh, Cape Kennedy. Okay, and long term, what do you envision for Starbase, uh, like a spaceport with flights coming and going, and Starship manufacturing, or what is the future role of Starbase? Uh, the future role of Starbase, I think, um, it's it's well suited to be kind of like our um, advanced R and D location. So it's like where we would try out uh, new designs and uh, new versions of the rocket, um, and. And, and then I think probably Cape Kennedy would be our sort of main operational uh, launch site. Um, and then, I don't know, over time, I think there's going to be, we'll have uh, floating spaceports, like ocean spaceports. Uh, we, we, we got these uh, two converted oil rigs that are, that are uh, going to be turned into orbital uh, launch sites. Um, and they, they can be moved around the world. So. Uh, you know, that, that, I think there could be quite a few of those. Um, you know, I think about, like, if, if I think about, like, uh, what would really work for long distance travel, uh, because the rocket is quite loud, um, you want to be, you know, I don't know, 20 miles away from a major city or 30 miles away from a major city, just so, so you don't, you know, um, you don't, not, uh, you know, disturbing people too much. Um, so I think uh, probably most of the launch sites long term will be uh, kind of ocean or sea uh, spaceports. So like maybe, maybe located like 20 miles, 30 miles offshore. Um, and th this would al allow uh, Starship to connect uh, any cities that are uh, on the ocean or on, on the sea. Um, and, and, and have a high flight rate, but w without uh, disturbing people too much. You know, I think people are willing to, you know, have, have something that's loud occasionally, but if you want to have it uh, frequently, then it, it, it probably needs to be off offshore. Hello, Elon. I'm uh, Cam Gerlach with the SpaceX Reddit community. Um, so you've talked a lot about how Raptor 2 is crucially important for, for Starship development and for the, the future of Starship. Um, so I, I'm curious, what, what general improvements have you made with Raptor 2 uh, to ensure it's not only more efficient and more powerful, but, but, also, but also much easier, easier to, to produce and less expensive as well and faster? And, and how, do you continue, how do you plan to continue to iterate further on the design in the future? So, um, Raptor 2 is uh, an almost complete redesign relative to Raptor 1. So basically everything from the turbo machinery to the, the, the chamber nozzle, uh, the electronics, um, basically everything's been, been redesigned. You can see the, the difference over there, the Raptor 1 versus Raptor, Raptor 2. Um, the, you know, a, a, a lot of the changes were um, deleting things. So we deleted a lot, uh, consolidated a lot. Um, the uh, rotating machinery, especially the inducers of the turbo pumps, are a lot more robust. Um, 
We uh, converted a bunch of flanges to welds. Um, uh, and we, we're actually, over time, we'll convert even more flanges to welds. I hate flanges. Uh, you know, especially if you've got uh, high pressure uh, and, uh, and a cryogenic uh, fluid or, or super hot gas, uh, flanges and seals are a nightmare. Um, and so, you know, we've got parts of that engine that are, um, you know, sort of seven, eight hundred bar, uh, you know, sort of eleven, twelve thousand psi, which is nutty. Um, and um, and so, just uh, go, going to welded joints in, instead of flanges was pretty helpful. Um, the uh, pre-burner controllers have been consolidated into a, a sort of a unified box, as opposed to being kind of like all over the engine. Um, so and we're, we're getting close to the point where um, I think uh, Raptor will not need shrouds. So shrouds are a huge pain in the ass, like basically putting a sh whole shield around the engine, especially for the gim gimbling engines, uh, where it's got to kind of ha like have like a sort of a, you know eyeball seal, like it's ro like rotating in a circle with a, a hot gas seal. Um, so uh, w with a bit more deletion and integration, I think we the the engine. Uh, will be f sort of flame proof, uh, more or less, and, uh, and, th and then we can get rid of the shrouds, which would be a big mass savings. Yeah. So, a lot more could go on. Um, <laughs> we're also operating at a higher chamber pressure. Um, I, think, um, I, I think we could probably operate, uh, I think over time we can operate it at 330 bar sustained in the main chamber. Um, and um, w without having the, uh, the, the pre-runner pressures be too high uh, by essentially uh, uh, n not by losing less pressure. There's like a whole pressure ladder going from the, the, the turbo pumps and pre-runners to the, the main chamber. And by getting rid of a bunch of the choke points, uh, we, we can um, have less pressure loss. Uh, and so the, the pumps can uh, effectively produce uh, you know, more pressure in the main, main chamber. Uh, due to uh, less, uh, a few, a few less, less loss in the uh, secondary systems. Um, do you have any, any, I have specific questions or? Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, Chris Gephardt with NASA Space Flight. Um, can you talk a little bit about the abort modes that are available for ship if there were ever to be a problem during the climb to orbit? What, what would be available to the crew? in that regard, and also on that same level, the life support systems for ship. Um, where do those stand, and what are the challenges that you're finding with just the sheer volume in Starship for that? Thank you. So uh, Starship will not have um, an independent abort system, but I think something that would make sense is to have the thrust to weight of the ship uh, be enough that uh, it could do um, a, a, a it, it, it could take off from uh, the booster, even if the booster has a failure at the pad level. So if you, if you can get the, the thrust to weight of the ship uh, at sea level above one, then even if there is something goes wrong with the booster, the ship can essentially fly away from the booster. And so that's uh, something that uh, I think would be important for, for carrying people uh, and, and also for high value cargo to have the ship uh, have thrust to weight greater than one even at uh, sea level. Um, and then the, the there's, there's a, the, like I said, I, that would be like the nine engine version. And, and then even if you lost one engine, um, I think you should still be able to uh, do an abort. So I think for crewed missions, we would essentially um, maybe detank the ship to some degree so that you'd have uh, kind of a launch abort capability with the ship even if you lost an engine. That, that'd be my recommendation. Um, from a life support standpoint, uh, uh, we would um, have a, uh, a, a sort of a re sort of a, a renewable like uh, for for long you know we 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 could scale up uh, the life support system in Dragon that would certainly be an option, um, and and that would work for uh, missions that are say. Um, a week or, or two weeks, that, that, that would be fine. For missions to, to Mars, uh, you, you'd want uh, a life support system that uh, is renewable. Um, so it, or it's essentially recycling, recycling everything um, 
in a, in, in a closed loop system with um, I, I, close to zero uh, lust mass. Um, so that would be um, a more advanced system because um, you'd have to convert the CO2 back into O2 uh, and uh, kind of recycle, you know, poop and urine and stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so that that's a harder problem, but it's not it's not an immediate problem. We can certainly uh, scale up Dragon for any kind of uh, missions that are, you know, a few weeks long. Hi, Elon. Uh, Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Thanks for taking some questions. Um, I'm wondering if you do get that approval from the FAA in March. I know that there's really no way of knowing, but could you talk a little bit about the hardware readiness, sort of where you are technically? You know, the, the launch tower is, is pretty incredible, um, but but sort of the rocket, the ground system, software. Like, if, if you were to get some kind of approval from the FAA in March, you know, would you be looking at, you know, how quickly could the hardware be ready to go? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're uh, close to having the hardware ready to go. Um, so right now, I think we're, we're tracking to have the um, regulatory approval and hardware readiness around the same time. Um, yeah, so, yeah, around the same, you know, ho hopefully, you know, you know, basically a couple months for, for both. Um, Hi, Seth Krakowski with SpaceExport.com. You mentioned launching from the sea. Could you give us an update on the current status of using Phobos and Deimos for Starship operations? Yeah, so Phobos and Deimos thus far have been um, a relatively low priority. Uh, we needed to make the launch site here uh, work. Um, this has been you know, quite a difficult endeavor. Um, so we deprioritized the uh, Phobos and Deimos um, and just last month, we, we, we started to, um, we we're going to take uh, one of them and, and, and build at least a catch tower on it. So, uh, and, and ultimately we will, ultimately meaning like, I don't know, later this year, <laughs> um, uh, build a, a, a full launch capability um, on, um, on one of the platforms. So I think pro hopefully by the end of this year, we, we will have uh, a launch capability at Cape Kennedy at 39A and uh, on one of the, the, the ocean platforms as well. Hi, Ellen. This is Adam Cardona with CBS4 and NBC23 here in the Rio Grande Valley. This is more of a community-based question. This past week, several BISD students, community leaders, and community members got together to ask you a question and to show their gratitude. Not sure if you got that message yet, but they were saying thank you, Elon. And they wanted to know if you would be able to attend their Chato's Days festivities here in Brownsville. So <laughs> on behalf of them, will you be attending Chato's Days? Uh, it sounds like fun. So like, uh, when, when is it? I believe it starts on the 19th through the 25th. So you have several days to attend Sombrero Festival, Chato Days Parades, enjoy some great food. Will, will we see you there? I will be there. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be hard to follow up. Hey, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut here. Uh, okay, so a little bit more Raptor 2 talk again. Um, where are you at as far as production? How many do you have? Uh, you know, you you know, are they how are they handling you know testing? Uh, are they more cantankerous, less cantankerous? You know, just give us a little, little more rundown, like on where you're actually at. Is that a bottleneck for the next booster as well? Right? We assume the next booster is going to require yeah. you know Raptor 2. So kind of where are you at with uh, with the production and the and the testing so far? Well, uh, I mean, right now, of, of any technical problem, uh, I'm spending the most time personally on, on uh, Raptor 2. Um, like, really, they're, they're like the two things that occupy the most number of mental cycles are Raptor 2 and Tesla full self driving. Um, so, uh, the, the only remaining issue that we're aware of is melting the chamber. Um, so that thing really wants to melt, you know. It's got like on the order of a gigawatt of, of heat, so it's 
pretty hot. Like a gigawatt is like a, what a nuclear power plant produces. So it really is desperately trying to melt at any point in time. Um, so uh, we've got, uh, you know, we're flowing an, an immense amount of, of, of cryogenic fuel to cool the, the, the chamber in the channels. Uh, we have uh, head end co uh, film cooling. We've got uh, throat film cooling. And we're just trying to get the uh, exact sort of balance between uh, head end foam cooling and uh, throat foam cooling uh, to not melt the chamber. Um, I think we're pretty close. Um, like we have, we have uh, a couple engines in the stand that uh, that have, uh, I think, uh, seven or eight hundred seconds of operation and several uh, start cycles. So it's looking looking positive but that's the that's the that's the remaining uh, issue is uh, melting the chamber um, but in the, in the meantime we're, we're, we're scaling up old production to get to uh, one a day or better um, so apart from melted chambers uh, we're, we're, we're doing well we've got a lot of pumps um, a lot of electronics a lot of pre burner controllers um, so uh, just uh, not melting the chamber which is very difficult. <laughs> Um, is the kind of the, the last remaining challenge, um, but I think we're, we're very close to solving that. Um, and then the the production system has, has a lot of momentum. Like I said, um, you know we're we're really um, you know if like like next week we'll probably make at least five or six uh, Raptor twos, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll be at at a seven a week. Or, or better by next month. But I, these, those are crazy, these are crazy numbers for rocket engines, by the way. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, Elon. Uh, Robert Perlman with Space.com and CollectSpace. Um, you mentioned the NASA contract for the human landing system. At one point, do you envision splinter, splintering off development of Starship for HLS, or how are you going to balance the timelines of rapid reusability versus NASA's own schedule of when they're ready to go to the moon? I, I don't think there's really a conflict there. Um, we're going to be making a lot of ships, a lot of boosters, uh, obviously a lot of engines. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting, like the, the uh, with the booster with 33 engines and the ship with nine engines is 42. There we go again. Um, and that was a totally total coincidence. Um, so, you know, a adding uh, legs to land on the moon, uh, I, we do not think is like a, that's, that can be done pretty quickly. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't really see any conflict between the ra achieving rapid reusability and, and getting to the moon. Um, yeah, the a, a high production rate solves many ills, uh, so we're aiming for a high production rate. Hi, Lauren Grush with The Verge. I'm wondering if you can clarify the number of launches that you plan to conduct in order to do these refillings. I know a lot of numbers have been thrown around, so I'm wondering if you have landed on a final number. And how quickly do you plan to launch those missions back to back to refuel the vehicle to get to the moon? Thanks. Yeah, so the The missions would, would happen pretty fast for um, refilling the, the vehicles uh, to minimize boil off of the cryogenic propellants. Um, so um, now for the for the vehicle going to the moon, uh, we uh, have some uh, insulation uh, to, to minimize uh, boil off. Um, uh, but we'd probably be launching, I don't know, probably uh, every few hours. Um, aspirationally. So, yeah. Hi, Elon. Kevin Haymeyer from Space Eccentric on YouTube and Rumble. My, thank you. My viewers are really hungry to know anything about the interior design for crewed Starship. Uh, you have HLS, you have Dear Moon, 
And last we heard, maybe a year or two ago, you were looking to hire Tesla employees to design the interior for Starship. How's that going? Yeah, um, well, it, we, we, have, we aren't focusing a lot on the interior quite yet. I mean, that will be important down the road, but uh, our focus right now is just getting to orbit and proving out uh, return of the booster and return of the ship. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's fundamentally very difficult to build a fully reusable rocket uh, given the strength of Earth's gravity and the density of our atmosphere. Um, like, there's no, you, you can't have a, a lot of uh, mass margin. Um, so our focus is, is solving that rapid reusability. Um, like I said, we'll have a high, high production rate, so we're not dependent on rapid, we're not dependent on full reusability, but, but really that's the breakthrough that's, that's fundamentally important to change the course of human civilization to become a multi-planet species. Elon, this will be the last question for you. Uh, evening, Elon. I'm Bob Duncan. I'm a local resident. Okay, the, are we cutting out? Is that better? Hi, evening. My name is Bob Duncan. I'm a local resident here, here in the area. And first off, thank you for a, a very cool evening. So this has been a lot of fun for us. As a local resident, it's been exciting to watch the amazing progress that SpaceX has made here in Boca Chica. And I was just curious, uh, we're standing on the southern tip of the state of Texas. We're a few hundred yards from your residence. Could you just speak to what, if anything, has been appealing or advantageous about operating in the state of Texas? versus other parts of the country. Thank you. Well, I, th I think we've, you know, the, um, <laughs> um, well, well, I mean, we've had a lot of support from the, the community and, um, you, know, uh, you know, something that just happens over time with uh, societies is that kind of rules and regulations build up um, and they, they build up you know, more in some places than others. Uh, and they didn't, uh, you know, uh, I think Texas has the, the, the right amount of rules and regulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the evening. And, um, I think we, we might be able to get you closer to the rocket if you'd like. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll get you as close as possible while still being safe. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to, to you know, take pictures, have a good time. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, let, let's uh, go like hell to have an exciting future. Thank you. Woo!